Who's pushing them in? I got this idea because uh, I heard a quote when I was in South Africa last time talking to people about the tyranny of the apartheid system and post-apartheid South Africa is still struggling hugely, as some of you know that pay any interest at all in that country. Um, this is a line I took out of a quote by Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, a church leader, a pastor, a bishop in the church, one of us, I suppose. And he said about the apartheid system and about the state of South Africa and what apartheid was doing to South Africans. He said that it's no good, he said you can only rescue so many people, so many drowning people from the river, before you have to go upstream to see who's pushing them in. And what he meant was that the apartheid system, the legalized system of oppression, was forcing people into behaviors and into habits and into choices that were to do with their survival because they didn't have the options available to them that the white people had. They didn't have an educational option available to them. They didn't have housing and work opportunities and promotion and self-improvement and self-determination was not an option to them because oppressed majorities, which is the case in South Africa, the black people are hugely majority, oppressed by a white minority, or if it's an oppressed minority, the common denominator of oppressed people in all walks of life is that they feel that the options that are available to the oppressors are not available to them. So they feel pushed in, therefore, because of their narrow options to have to just do things and make choices and behave in a way that they'd rather not, but they feel they have no options. So Desmond Tutu could see that addiction and crime and violence and all this stuff going on in the grassroots of South African society is not because people wanted to live that way. It's because they felt they had no choice but to survive in an oppressive regime. They felt pushed in. And what Desmond Tutu was saying is that the church need to realize that we are never going to be able to rescue all of them. There's too many. That if we spend our time putting out fires, instead of finding out who is putting kerosene on the fire, if we spend our time rescuing drowning people, as it were, there's going to be too many. We're going to get so exhausted trying to rescue them that we, the best we can do is put a sticking plaster on a hugely, you know, messed up, broken situation, broken society. So Desmond Tutu was saying, I think for longevity, to change this historically, we, the church, are going to at least have to try to have a voice into governments and into the, into the top end of where all this is happening because decisions are being made that cascade down to grassroots people and we are at this end, we're at the sort of grassroots rescuing end and realizing we have got no chance. The odds are against us from being able to make a dent on this. Even if we rescue a thousand a day, there's millions of them in the water. It's that thought I want you to think about today, about your own life. Many of you here feel trapped and stuck in life choices that you're making, but you kind of feel, I've got no option. I don't know what else I can do. I don't know what else, which way I can turn. I just feel pushed in. I feel cornered. I feel trapped into behaving this way, into saying those things, into making those choices, into cutting those people out of my life, into doing something that maybe upsets people and makes me look like the bad person. I just don't know what to do. Some of you know what this is like personally, on a personal level. Some of you feel trapped and pushed in. And you spend your life in conversations, as you know, that are kind of rescue-ish in their sound. You spend your life in, in sort of trying to keep your head above water every day. And some days you have better days than other days, but it's, it's a life pattern of above and beneath the water. And there's only a few things any day that can nudge you up or down in the life that you're living and you feel powerless. And you feel the ones that could help you are not. And you feel the ones that could give you a hand and keep you out of the water long term are not. Um, I talk to police officers around the world who are sick and tired. And some of you here 
uh, perhaps in the police force or the law enforcement agencies or the courts or the justice system. And police officers tell me they are sick and tired of arresting the same people every week. <laughs> but they kind of feel these people are living rough and living on the streets and they're addicts and they're homeless, but they don't want to be. That these people have a story and these people have something upstream of where the police officers find them. They have a story. And in this story is a number of things that if they had been listened to, if these things had been, had been helped and healed and spoken into and somehow offered um, cure for and help for, then they would maybe not have finished up in the mess that they are in. And every human being has a story. That's why you should never judge a book by its cover. Ne never judge a person based on their appearance. Never, never assume something about a person based on an act of desperation and drowning because that was once you. If we did that towards you, you would feel so misunderstood and judged. And so we, the church of all, should not be doing that to other human beings. We of all, like Jesus taught us, should not be assuming just because people are in a certain season or lifestyle or habit of life that that sums up their life. No one photograph of your life sums up your life. No one moment of your life defines your life. And we should not do that to people. And I think in the church we have majored on rescue and we've minored on prevention. In the church, we have built rescue stations. Our church have become lifeboat rescue stations. And we send out the lifeboats and we rescue the drowning. It's become part of our fundamental theology. And I'm all for rescue. I believe that rescue is part of what we are to do. I know that God rescues people. And that will be the right word someone, some of you would feel about what you feel God did in your life. You desperately felt in need of rescue when you gave your life to Christ. So I'm not against rescue. What I'm saying to you is what Desmond Tutu said, rescue is not a long-term strategy. Prevention is. So if we can go upstream, and that's what Koi was saying on that video about Cambodia, that he was saying that education breaks the cycle of poverty, but it doesn't do it overnight. So if you want to do something that changes society generationally, you may have to be the ones that do the groundwork for which there'll be no thanks given to you 50 years from now. That the freedoms that we enjoy, the freedoms that we enjoy that were purchased by those that went to war on our behalf, either went to war literally with warring nations that were against our liberties, those that are fighting against terrorism in the world, or whether it was other humanities and civil liberties, those that, those that fought for equality and liberties and freedoms, their names are forgotten in history. Some get highlighted like Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela. Their names become famous. But there are millions of others who are nameless and faceless like us in this room today. On any given day, can say something, can do something that contributes towards, towards a long-term prevention. And because that isn't sexy... It's not glamorous. It's not highlight worthy. It's not exciting. You can't put it on screen and say, see how we change these people's lives. It's behind the scenes. It's foundational. It's groundwork. And it's not exciting. And because we become obsessed with instantaneous results, we get addicted to rescuing drowning people. Because you were drowning, now you're not. Tell us your story. I was lost and I am found. We like that. It's good for publicity. And that's good, but if we want to be here making a difference as a church a hundred years from now, if we want this planet to look different a hundred years from now, if we don't want the same people being arrested a hundred years from now because it's their kids and their kids' kids that have been arrested now, because generationally that behavior established inside the family. If we don't want that to happen, then we have to do things on our watch that contribute to going upstream in our theologies, in our teaching, in our wisdom for life contribution to ourselves and from the church to the world. If we don't want to see the church as a Sunday morning rescue station, but we want to see the church as, as salt and light, as an alternative idea, as a revolutionary alternative movement, 
as a whole new society, a whole new idea, a whole new breed of people in the earth. That we're not known for being weird and odd shabadabadoers. That we think that is our distinctive and that's our standout. And we're glad to be persecuted for it because it proves that, you know, we're serving God because the world hates us and we get some kind of kudos and leverage from that. It's crazy. I grew up with salt and light. The definition of that always seemed to me to be a bit rude and offensive. But salt and light can be as subtle as they can be stark and shocking. Lighting can be beautiful and subtle. It's still light in the world. Light in the world, I was told, is kind of dazzling people with the gospel. We flash the torch in their face. Or we throw salt in and let them know how rotten they are because the saltiness is so stark to let them know we're the salting brigade. And what I think I want to say to you today is I want you to think about where can you begin to be part of a long-term contribution? Because as, as Coy said, if we can educate these kids and the kids on screen, maybe it'll be their grandkids that will inherit a new world in Cambodia. Maybe their kids and their kids' kids will be the ones that will be the future governments and, and corporates and educators and welfare workers and health cares and justice system people. Maybe, maybe two, three generations from now, those kids and their kids' kids will be creating a whole new Cambodia. But if you go into Cambodia, like Tim's going today, if you go into Cambodia, as many charities have, with a rescue the drowning mentality, we have no legacy in that country then. And so this struck me because I knew in pastoring that I think we got we got addicted to rescue and I realized there were so many needy people in our city that I thought, I don't want to build a new social services in this church. That these people were previously dependent on social welfare and social services and rehab programs and, and, and coming off addiction programs and, and handouts from the government and 12-step AA programs. I didn't want the church to become another addition to that range of rescue ideas. I wanted the church to become a place where you get new ideas for your life, where we show you cause and effect and we empower you to figure out that things are pushing me in and I'm doing things that push myself in. That I have mentalities and ways of thinking that I think I'm a self-inflicted harming person. I'm a self-harming human. And if we can show you what you may be doing that is causing you to have the problems you have and show you alternative ideas that will lessen that in your life, I think it's been worth being in church today. But if all we do is rah, rah, you up, you get excited, you fall down, you glow in the dark when the Spirit's on you. And you have this Holy Spirit encounter. Then you come back next week to have one again. Then next week we have one again. Then we have another one. Then we have a conference where we can do it for three days. Now we just have more and more and more and more encounter. Believe me, 32 years pastoring, I'm all encountered out. And I'm all for encounter. I know that. I believe in the supernatural. But what I think we've done in our kinds of churches, Pentecostal, charismatic churches, I think we've majored on encounter and we've minored on education. I think we've majored on cure and we've minored on prevention. So we finish up rescuing the same people every week like the cops are arresting the same people every week. The same people come for prayer and ministry and counseling and deliverance and encounter and to, and to have a touch from God. The same people every week. And we kind of feel that that somehow looks like we're doing our job. It creates a sense of momentum, creates a sense of excitement and breakthrough and lives changed. But those lives are in breakthrough and change for as long as the service lasts, very often. And then people leave that place of encounter and go into a very defeating, negative, depressed, suicidal, agonizing, painful week. Then come back next week for an encounter again. So the church becomes like this place where I go and get a top-up. It's like rehab. And then I go out all week and struggle again. And people form this codependent relationship with Christianity because we lead them to believe that rescue is all we do. And I know churches like Riverview around the world, and you are rare because I know that because of your history, 
and your history of leaderships, you are a thinking church. Some of you are drawn here because you don't want to be somewhere that is majoring on yeah, yeah, rah, rah, and nothing's happening. You, you, are, you are open to inspiration. We want this to be inspirational. I believe things should be inspirational, but inspiration is not a good foundation for your life. Inspiration, by definition, is ephemeral. It is fleeting. It is a fog. And so we can't build on inspiration. We can build on wisdom. Solomon said, by wisdom a house is built, not by inspiration. If the wisdom is inspirational, even better. But it's the wisdom part that we want you to leave with today. We want to add something, give value to your life today so that you can go out of here and you can respond differently today to something that you've been responding faultily and negatively and unwisely to for the last few weeks. And we give you something, an idea. If this would make you leave here and think, you know what, I need to be less judgmental of that person and I need to have a different conversation than the endless cycle of rescue conversations. And I think I need to say to this person some wisdom that is an upstream of where you've been pushed in conversation. You know, the world is understanding that we're not going to beat the plastics issue by fishing plastic out of the ocean. There's too much plastic like there's too many humans drowning. So the world are understanding the plastic situation is going to get resolved, not in our lifetime, but we made a start. Our kids and kids' kids will live perhaps in a plastic-free or disposable plastic-free world, but we may have started on our watch. You may not get thanked for it. Your name may not be in lights, but our kids will live in a better world. Our ocean ecosystems will be better because on our watch, we decided to do something that was our contribution to a better world, a better environment, a better recycling. We decided to recycle a bit. We decided to get a less, you know, gas-guzzling vehicle. We, we, we got rid of our private jets. You three people over there. We did something. I think that's all history would require of us. But I think if we don't do that, then we tend to live for the span of our generation and we're not mindful that we can set things in motion. This is why I teach a message around the world called the cathedral in your heart. Because I realized years ago that the ancient cathedrals of Europe took an average of two to 500 years to build. And I was fascinated, how did leaders keep people interested financially in something they knew they'd never see finished? I know as a pastor that went through four major building programs, how difficult it was to keep people on board for a year. Never mind 500 years. So these people were giving their lives and their strength, their resources, their money, their blood, sweat, and tears to a project they knew they would never see finished, but spent their lives for it anyway. Society thrives when men plant trees under whose shade they know they will never sit. I think that's what Desmond Tutu is saying, that if we can involve in things that are to do with causes, that are pushing in society, pushing in humans to lifestyles and behaviors and choices and generational choices that they'd rather not have, that would be a better work for our hands to do. We'll rescue as many as we can in the meantime. But if rescue is all we do, I promise you, and this is what many churches are doing around the world, we're repeatedly rescuing the same people who just go out and drown again, then come back and get saved again next week, then drown again, then get saved again another week, and on and on it goes. And we've got to break the cycle, I think, not just that the Cambodian cycle of poverty. We have to break the cycle of codependence in the church that people have formed towards God. That I get messed up and God delivers me. He's my savior. He's my deliverer. He is my healer. Yeah, he's all of that. He should be all of that once and for all in our lifetimes. He shouldn't need saving more than once or deliverance more than once. Because the idea with God and us is that we become self-regulating, self-delivering, self-empowered people, and we grow with all the onboard equipment we need and the resourcefulness. This is why Jesus sent out the disciples with nothing. He said, you'll have no advanced bookings, you'll take no luggage, you'll have no money. What? He's not doing it to be mean or to create some artificial discomfort for them to sort of prove how lacking in faith they are. 
He is sending them out with resources in order to find out how resourceful they are. What they did was they made relationships with people. And if you're welcomed into a home, which meant you had to approach people well, go into a city, be kind and loving and come to serve. Don't go into town doing this. He says, the homes that welcome you, that's where you'll have your shower and your bed and your food. In other words, they, were, they had to go and build relationships because their resources would be in their relationships. People had what they needed. And so if you build relationships with people, then all the stuff you think you need to carry, despite people, you'll find people have and are glad to share with you. He's teaching them early on that I want you to be a resourceful human. I want you to know how to figure things out. I want you to build relationships. I want you to be collaborative people. I want you to network and work with people. Don't go into town, say, I don't need any of you because I, I came in on my own jet. I got my own budget, my own hotel. My own. And I'm all for all of that being good for us and comfortable. But this resourcefulness he taught them is fascinating to me because he didn't want them to live this kind of hand-to-mouth, rescuing, divine intervention life. I go with nothing. Is the idea, God, I go to town with nothing and you supernaturally send me money and a place to stay and manna appears on the floor. Now that was the old covenant. This new covenant isn't like that. This new covenant isn't God outside of you intervening. This new covenant is God living in you. You're not trying anymore to access anything. God is nowhere that you need to go and find him. There's nothing you need to go and get. There's no mountain you need to climb. There's no pilgrimage you need to take. There's nothing you need to do. There's no one up the mountain on behalf of you finding out what God thinks about you and you're hoping he'll come down and have a good report. There's no, there's no check-in you need to have. There's no annual report. There's no assessment of how you're doing from the boss down to you. That's not our job as leaders. It's not God's job towards you. You are saved. You are home and dry. Jesus came to make his home inside you eternally. Yet we have millions and millions of New Testament believers living in an Old Testament mindset. Still thinking God is outside of me. This is why I don't like the language of let's enter his presence. What does it even mean? How can he enter presence when God lives inside you? It suggests if you can enter it, that you can leave it. I don't like that idea. It suggests the presence of God is here. And when you leave, are you then leaving the presence? Because the flip side of that is that you're leaving his presence. Let's enter his gates with thanksgiving. There is no gates anymore. That's an Old Testament idea, but it fosters this sense of externalism that God is external to me and I enter his presence and I go through gates. No, you don't. There's no gates anymore. There's no temple. There's no entering and leaving. God lives in you eternally. He's eternally in you. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. He's not in one day. You are not a hotel. You're not God's hotel. You're not God's timeshare. You're not his apartment. You know, he's Airbnb. He lives in you permanently. You are his home. H-O-M-E, you're his home. So we've got to stop any kind of theology that leads you to believe that he is not your home, that you need to keep, as it were, accessing him, or you need to keep going to the front door, inviting him in. Like he left your home, then you've got to get him to come back in. And we have this Christianity that's based on this Old Testament mentality where we kind of feel we have to re-earn and we have to re-enter and re-engage and kind of court and get God to smile on us again and love us again and bless us again. And a lot of preachers deal in shame and guilt projection so that you kind of begin to feel, yeah, I have messed up. Yeah, my life isn't great. Yeah, I'm not right with God. And we trade on that. So we're rescuing you every week from your own guilty conscience that we are part of putting on you. So we are building churches that push people in. If I lead you to believe that the deal around here is that every time you have a problem, you come and get deliverance, I'm pushing you into a deliverance mentality. I'm pushing you into a divine intervention mentality. I'm pushing you into God is your resource to get you free mentality rather than me saying to you, hang on, let's go upstream a little bit here. You're never gonna need a hand laying on your head ever again in your life in some areas if you can figure some stuff out. And the problem is this, and this is a problem in apartheid South Africa and other long-term, long-standing oppressive regimes, 
is that if you're born into drowning, to be born into an apartheid South Africa as an oppressed part of that system, to be born black into an oppressive regime, to be born three generations in, means that you are born drowning. From birth, you need to be rescued. And what happens is that when drowning becomes generational, like it is in Cambodia, and like it is in Australia, by the way, and England, we have many other forms of this that are far more subtle, is that when you're born drowning, you never know anything other than trying to get rescued. You're born grasping for rescue. And so this is how difficult it becomes to step into a generationally drowning scenario with a new idea. People think you've been loving and careless. And some of us are afraid of being seen to be not being compassionate. So instead, we don't give people wisdom for life. And I believe that if people are starving, this is what Jesus said to the crowd in John 6. He said, I know you're all following me because yesterday I fed the 5,000. And I hope in another free meal will happen today. He understood humans because we're like that. And he said, I know you're thinking there'll be another miracle today of some kind of material provision. And you're all following me because the words got out. He fed 5,000 yesterday. We got a free meal yesterday. It was awesome. Tell your friends, family, it's going to happen anytime soon. But if, you, if you're not there, it's like bingo. You've got to be there to win. But he said to the crowd, I want to tell you guys about another kind of bread. And he said he talked, and he talked about the bread of life and tried to explain to them that you'll forever need to be for walking around with someone to rescue you. Unless I tell you about another bread, this other bread means that you will not need to live your life depending on someone else to feed you. It's like the woman at the well. I'm going to tell you about a source that means you won't need to spend your life at this well every day. Let me tell you about another water. So he uses a literal water metaphorically to speak about a more significant, long-lasting water that means you don't live your life needing rescue. You all okay? I was recently studying crime statistics in Japan. Don't ask. What I found fascinating is that Japan has the largest population of elderly prisoners of any prison system in the world. The 20% of Japanese prisoners are pensioners. You know, like 70, 80 plus up there. The average percentage around the world would be 3, 5% max. It's hugely disproportionate. So I began to study it. And what I found out is in Japan, there is no welfare system for the elderly. So many of the elderly in Japan finish up almost homeless. They have no money, no retirement plans. They can't take care of themselves. There's no welfare system. There's no state pension. They're on their own. And so many of them are borderline homeless and starving. And so what happens is because Japan gives you long jail sentences for small crimes, the elderly are deliberately committing crime so that they can go to jail and be taken care of. What a brilliant idea. And they have three meals a day, they are taken care of, they have a routine, they have friendship, they have a bed, they have a roof over their head, their medications are taken care of, all free. So I saw some of these guys interviewed on YouTube, a documentary I watched, and this guy was saying, he's 82, he's on his third jail sentence since he was 70. And he'd realized his mistake was his crimes were too small. So his first crime was he stole some sellotape from a shop for which he got six months in jail. It was a $3 crime that cost Japan about $200,000. That's how crazy, and that's, by the way, how much waste there is in government that are, that are flinging money at things that are not the problem. They're the symptom of a deeper problem. So he realized that, and his friends in jail said to him, who had been there long term for worse crimes, let me tell you how bad the crime gets in a minute to get you a long jail sentence. They said, you need to go do something worse. So he left jail and he stole a bicycle, which gave him three years in jail. He was so happy. <laughs> and his friends said, no, 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 you need to go and do something that gets you in here for 10. Then you might die here. And he'd die in comfort and safety and so on and so on. So he went out after he got free from his second jail sentence, got a knife, threatened a woman in the park with the knife, no intention of hurting her at all. Then put the knife down, sat down, waited for the cops to come, got 10 years in jail. He was so happy. 
My point is, if you looked at that on a basic look, you'd think Japan has an elderly citizen crime problem. It does not. Japan has a welfare problem that's forcing pensioners to commit crime so that they can be taken care of. That's the problem. That's the conversation we need to be having because the system is pushing them in. And it's that that's the equivalent of all around the world. This is why our government, and I don't know what you're doing in Australia, but last year the UK government appointed a minister, a cabinet member, a minister of suicide. Because we're aware that suicide statistics are so out of control around the world. By the way, it's got more out of control since the arrival of social media. Especially amongst young people who are committing suicide in unprecedented numbers in 2019. So the awareness of the statistics being so drastic made our government appoint a minister of suicide. I don't know what his or her brief is because the suicide minister is appointed based on the statistics of those that succeeded in killing themselves. But there are many, 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 many more that are drowning right now who we don't know about, who are on the way to suicide, but they don't show up on the statistics yet because they haven't succeeded. In other words, suicidal tendencies are generic in society, especially amongst young people. This, this cancer is eating away at our young people and social media is exacerbating it. If they feel stressed and a failure and a misfit, social media will help you enforce that. But my point is that if the government, if all the government does is slash away at the foliage of suicide because they meet it at the point of which we think we can rescue people last minute, rather than go upstream and find out what's pushing them in like social media, like trauma in their early years, like depression. Depression is an all-time high. You know, we live in a most sophisticated society of all generations, but depression, again, like suicide, which is often a leader towards suicide, depression is. Depression is an all-time high. It is crazy out of control in all stages of life. And what new research is showing is that depression is very often far more to do with human disconnection than it is chemical. We, but we have a medical system that is throwing drugs at people with depression, uh, Prozac and whatever it is that you use here in Australia, these, these drugs that we've been using for decades now to treat depression as if it's a chemical issue. And for some people, those drugs work. And for some people, that chemical artificial introduction of serotonin helps balance them out chemically. But for many, 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 that soon wears off and it's not the answer because we are now bothering around the world. Not enough of us, we're bothering around the world because we know there's too many drowning and we can't medicate them all. We're now getting to the stage where we're like with plastics in the ocean or global warming and so on. We're now trying to figure out why are so many people depressed? And the answer is they're depressed for a range of reasons, chief of which is a massive sense of lack of connection with humans, loneliness, isolation, people feeling they have no meaningful contribution in life, people feeling they're invisible and they don't count. So people feel they're pushed in to oblivion and isolation and loneliness. And in that desperation, they begin to entertain suicidal thoughts. They begin to turn inward and lock themselves off from the community. Some of you in here have battled with depression, have people in your family that you love that are battling depression. And it, it bothers you terribly because some of their black dog days, the bipolar strugglers, the black dog moods and days are so terrible and so terrifying, you wonder, will they be here tomorrow? And I want you to know that we as God's people, we as the church, don't want to continue to be part of the problem by slashing away foliage. And you know, this is how complicated it gets because, because though we may know as a society that depression is far more complicated than a chemical imbalance in the brain, we may know that. But the problem is that there are billions and billions of dollars to the pharmaceuticals to stay invested in giving us drugs we don't need. And the problem is governments are hand in glove with pharmaceutical companies 
And so those that are rescuing us are complicit in helping us drown. And the corporates are involved with governments and together they're all involved in giving us drugs we don't need. And none of them are saying to us, you don't need these drugs, so we're going to put all that money instead of into pills, we're going to put it into re-education, we're going to put it into finding out what's pushing us in, we're going to have new kinds of governments, we're going to have new kinds of appointments, we're going to change the education system, we're going to change charities and welfare approaches to people, we're going to change the justice system, we're going to put new voices, new ideas, new philosophies in place so that we have less people in need of medication because we found out the causes are not just chemical, but fixing those things is far more intense and complex than just throwing a pill at it. But I tell you, the world's changing. We're realizing we're going to fix plastics by going upstream to the corporates and stopping it at source. We're going to deal with global warming by dealing with it at source and all of that stuff. And for us to be in a world that's understanding that, you millennials in here, you teenagers in here, you're coming up in a different world to the one we came up in. And I want to I wanna know that you're going to carry on the legacy of making sure our planet doesn't default to this rescue and drowning relationship with things that we want you to fix. Have a cathedral in your heart towards leaving something for your kids and your kids' kids that means they never have to be rescued again in their life. Because in your watch, you did something to go upstream and stop millions being pushed in to suicide and depression and despair and desperation and addiction and going to jail to keep warm. We did something to stop it. And I said to our church years ago, I don't want to build a church anymore because I'd done it for too long. I was exhausted. I don't want to build a church where we just rescue the same people every week. This is crazy. We can't do this. Let's step back and find out what, what is it that's causing these people to feel so helpless? Why are they generationally defaulting to the same behavior as their forefathers? What is the generational patterns? Can we, can we figure out what they are? Can we articulate it in a way that people go, ah, I did that yesterday and I didn't know it was part of the problem because we've always been like that in our family. Can we talk about things that get so real that people think, thank you, for that bit of wisdom. I'm going to do something different today. I'm going, to, I'm going to change that relationship. I'm going to say no to that situation. I'm going to remove myself from the family and friends WhatsApp channel. Because I feel that that is part of my stress and part of my drama. And all of that contributes to me finishing up at the end of the day feeling depressed and fed up and suicidal. It starts with things like that. It's conversations you'll have today and tomorrow and in the conversation, would you stop before you rescue someone? Would you pause and think, you know what? I'm not going to say that anymore. I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to make them think about what's happening. I'm going to make them take responsibility. I'm not going to have the responsibility shifted to me anymore. Would you do that? If we'd all do that a little bit, maybe we'd have an outcome in a few years from now.